Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow my honourable friend, the member for Leeds West, uh, and my right honourable friend, the uh, member for East Ham, the chair of the Select Committee. And I want to uh, build on some of the points they were making, both about the practical challenges that people face in the midst of this pandemic, but also some of the fundamental questions it should pose to each of us as members of a society that have left far too many people far too dangerously exposed, not just in the uh, face of this pandemic, but to everyday life, the plight that has gone unanswered for far too long. And I want to begin, Madam Deputy Speaker, also by paying tribute to particularly those workers in the NHS who are putting themselves, frankly, in harm's way as they treat people in the midst of this pandemic. And I absolutely echo what my honourable friend uh, for Leeds West said. It's crucial that NHS workers have access to the right kit to do the job. Absolutely. And that where there is any concern about the diagnosis of those NHS workers or their family members, that they are considered priority cases for testing. Frankly, the government's claim to be amongst the best in the world at testing only tells us that the rest of the world has much more to do because we are hearing far too many cases of people who do need to be tested not receiving that test. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, the crisis we face isn't just a public health crisis. It threatens to be an economic one. The supply and demand side shocks uh, that it will pose will be both simultaneous and severe. And that requires coordinated action on the part of government and industry on a scale that, frankly, we haven't seen since the Second World War. It is going to require a wartime mobilisation for this peacetime crisis. And for many families, this afternoon and this evening, as they gather around the kitchen table to consider what a loss of earnings or perhaps loss of employment would mean for them and their families, they are staring at the hard reality of a social insecurity system that has left far too many people grappling with poverty and insecurity and an ongoing crisis as a result for far too long. No one can or should be expected to live on statutory sick pay of £94.25 a week. No one should be expected to live on universal credit, which in some cases can be even less uh, generous, if that's the word, than statutory sick pay. And so I echo the calls we'll hear this afternoon for increases to statutory sick pay and universal credit to ensure that our social security system provides just that, social security, not just in the worst of times, but in the best of times for our country too. And I think ministers should ask, but frankly, so should people in our communities, how it was that the political choices of successive governments and, frankly, the political demands of sections of the electorate ever allowed a position in which we allow people who have fallen on hard times to fall into harder times further still because of the social insecurity system that pushes people further into poverty, mm -hmm. further into mental ill health and further into uh, family crises which make it harder, not easier, to escape from. I suspect, Madam Deputy Speaker, I am one of the one of a minority of people in this House who knows what it is like to grow up in a household that is reliant on the social security system, to know what it's like when there is more month left at the end of the more days left at the end of the month than there is money, what it is like when people have to beg, borrow and steal to put food in the fridge, what it is like when the electricity meter has run out mm -hmm. and so has the emergency, and what it is like uh, to feel a victim of the state rather than supported by the state. So we should resolve in the midst of this crisis that once this is over, never again are we going to allow our social security system to fail people in the way that it did before this crisis and which it threatens to do within this crisis. Yesterday, the Chancellor set out a whole series of measures to help businesses and to try and get the economy through this, and I welcome those measures. But we've got to learn from past mistakes. It is not enough to bail out businesses, which is important, 
we also have to bail out people. And as we build the economic recovery, we have to ensure that the quantitative easing that helps provide liquidity to our economy to help things going as, as best as they can in difficult times is also a quantitative easing for the people too. So by all means, let's call for an increase in statutory sick pay. Let's call for an increase in universal uh, credit. Let's call for an increase in disability benefits to make sure that people can live um, with dignity and a good quality of life if they are unable to work. All of those things are important. But instead of quibbling around with uh, piecemeal measures here, mortgage, a bit of mortgage relief here and a bit of rental support there, why don't we just provide every household in this country with the security to know that the government will provide protection for people's incomes so that they, continue, so they, they can continue to make sensible choices for their families, so that they know that when the end of the month comes and the mortgage is due, that they can pay it, so that they know when the rent is due, that they can pay it, so that they know that when the bills are due, they will be able to pay them, so that when they have to go and do their shop, that they will be able to pay for it. I have always been a sceptic of the principle of universal basic income because I fundamentally believe in an economy and a social security system that redistributes wealth from those who have it for the, to those who need it m uh, most. And, and I'm also cynical, Madam Deputy Speaker, because while there are many uh, principled and decent-minded champions of universal basic, basic income on the left of po politics, um, the left should regard the principle with suspicion when some of its leading champions have been uh, right-wing economists, like the in fact the, the father of free market uh, economics, Adam Smith. There is a right-wing vision of universal basic income which is about dismantling the state and which says, well, if we provide everyone with the income, we don't need to provide the services centrally because people can pay for it. It's one of the reasons, I suspect, why the Trump administration hasn't needed much persuasion to provide a form of basic income. But while we should regard the principle uh, with suspicion as an ongoing solution uh, to uh, how we provide social security for people. I think there is now a strong case for a form of basic income to see us through this crisis. It could be a universal payment made available to everyone where the tax system is used to recoup uh, uh, money from those who genuinely don't need it. Um, it could be a form of basic income where those who need it simply apply for it and then uh, receive it. Uh, it could be a form of income protection, like those described by my honourable friend, the member for Leeds West, which is already working well uh, in Scandinavia. But one way or another, we have to make sure that families have incomes to see themselves through this crisis, because, as we have already heard, the majority of people in this country tonight are one payday away, or lack of payday away, from being in a real crisis. And the crisis for them will be a crisis for all of us uh, if demand is further sucked out of the economy. So I hope that that's a message that ministers will take back to the Treasury. The final thing I want to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, is it's not just uh, the social insecurity system that's left people uh, exposed in this crisis. Uh, we've got to make sure that this is a turning point. It could be that our political choices further entrench inequality in our society. Frankly as the coalition and conservative governments did after the last financial crisis, where too many of the political decisions and too many of the so-called tough choices to balance the books were balanced on the backs of the poorest. I'll give way. Uh, the the hon. Member is making a very good speech, and I agree with much of what he, uh, if not all of what he has had to say. And he's making a very important point, coming to a very important point about what happens after all of this. There's been a massive fiscal stimulus over the last week, and we expect more to come. What we, I think all of us would expect is for us not to get into a position where we have austerity mark two in order uh, to see us out the other side of this. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with this point. And, and let me conclude now, Madam Deputy Speaker, by making uh, this point. In the aftermath of the last financial crisis, the Labour government, and in fact the reputation of the Labour Party, was utterly trashed because Gordon Brown's government took the courageous steps that were needed to prevent a financial crisis in America, which became a global financial crisis, uh, becoming a depression where people wouldn't be able to take money out of the banks. 
The government was right then not to be squeamish about borrowing, to make sure that our country got through it, and this government shouldn't be squeamish now. I suspect that by the end of this, the government will own a larger stake of the British economy uh, that will make Labour's last manifesto look positively conservative by comparison in its ambitions. And if that's what it takes to see us through this crisis, that is what the government will have to do. We are going to need a wartime response to get us through this crisis, so let us think now about the peace that will follow. And just as our generation looks back on that 1945 Attlee government with pride at the decisions they took and the legacy they left, let's think now about the legacy that we will leave for our country. Let's make the choices now that lessen inequality in our country and provide genuine social security uh, in the best of times, not just the worst of times. Let's ask how it was that political choices left our social, uh, social care system at breaking point and the people languishing in, in it more exposed to this pandemic than they would otherwise have been. And let's repair our broken social care system by making brave political choices. Let's care more about how we fund the living to lead a good life than about how we tax the dead. Let's make sure that when people look to old age, they're not just looking back on a life well lived, but able to live life to the full until the very end. Let's see this as a wake-up call, that if a pandemic can seriously disrupt the labour market and we have to provide serious income protection to see it, see it through, then let's think about what a technological revolution will do as it displaces, relocates and significantly changes the shape of the labour market. And let's make sure we have the social protections needed now to face the next revolution, not just the current crisis. And let's not let this global pandemic distract us from the urgency of the climate emergency. And let's make sure that our recovery from this is a green recovery. And finally, let's not, let's not listen any longer to the siren calls of the populists and the nativists who believe that countries can go it alone and that we have to build a world where we're all in it for ourselves and recognise that global problems require global solutions and global leaderships through global institutions. And just as the Attlee government rebuilt the fabric of the country through a new welfare state and built international institutions, let us resolve to do the same again. Yeah.